Let's get going. So, last lesson uh, I gave to you this idea. We, we had a look at what is history, EH cars. We gave this framework. We tried to understand, is this framework useful for understanding Korean history? Um, Donla. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yes. Oh, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I just wondered if anyone knew how to connect to the Ooh. I uh, Lana? I'm just blind. Is there a way for us to turn off the lights so we can see the like, cool um, light? I will try that. Yeah, I look better in the dark, as Fee said. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's okay for the cameras, but... Um, Donna, if you ask Yeji, she might be able to help with the internet. Hoxi, Yeji, Sam, what do you think about the internet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Lana, can you see now? Excellent, thank you. Um, Lana, then, what is history? Um, so, in my opinion, history is a recollection of events um, from a specific perspective, and usually it's always from the perspective of people who have had power or the majority in general as they are going to be the ones to write history in their opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems very good. Excellent. Uh, power is definitely a dynamic and particularly because those people that have the power are in charge of the bureaucracy. They're in charge of the administration. They're in charge of the record keeping in non-democratic, non-technologically developed societies. Only certain people can read and write. Literacy was often uh, not available to, let's say, the common people. And sometimes that was specifically done for a reason. If you think of Latin, if you think of traditional Chinese, these languages are very, very difficult and hard to learn. They take a lot of study. To be able to study those things, you need a lot of free time. To have free time, you might have slaves or serfs or people to work for you. So yes, history uh, does work a little bit like that. We tried to learn some things about early Korean history. Now, I gave the question of when did Korean history start, things like that last time. Uh, Tim, what can you tell us about early Korean history? Mm -hmm. Very good. There were early stories, yes. Anything wrong with the internet? Um, I'm not sure. Let me check. Don, is the internet working? Okay. No, 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 with the students, I, I guess they can't connect. Okay, I, I'm going to keep going. I'm sorry, don't know that might be advice. Okay. Maybe if you could help her, she might, she might be able to do it for you. Okay, so very good, Tim, there are stories. We also learned that there is archaeological evidence going back to about 10,000 years. We have stories that are written. You know, we, we can look at early Korean history through various different means. <clears throat> we learned that the Three Kingdoms were a time of strife. We learned that perhaps linguistically they weren't able to communicate with each other. You have sort of in the south uh, east, you have Shilla, which we're going to look at today. You have Baekje, you have Goguryeo. And these are three factions fighting with each other. I also showed you that today, Politically, the country is sort of divided. I guess if you're from the United States or you know United States, you might have coastal and inner regions where you see this political divide. In South Korea, it would be east and west. However, as I also tried to make out, it wouldn't really be appropriate to look at Korean politics or division through that American lens because you'll miss uh, so many parts. Now, as we look at Queen Sondok today, I like to try to give various theories. So in the first lesson, we looked at Benedict Anderson's Imagine Communities. 
trying to stress the fact that the nation exists ideationally in our head. That's where nations exist. You cannot see the physical reality of Korea. The name Korea has changed over time, but the land remains, the mountains, the trees. So we looked at imagined communities, we looked at Ka. We'll have a look at some ideas from Judith Butler's Gender Trouble. The theories that I sometimes introduce are not necessarily theories that I think are great or theories that I think I, I, I support. They might be. But it's more about do these theories allow us to understand the content better? That's what we're looking for. What is the practical use of this theory? Is it a tool that we can use? Now, before we get into Queen Sondok, some ideas from Butler's Gender Trouble. Judith Butler says, On occasion, feminist theory has been drawn to the thought of an origin, a time before what some would call patriarchy, that would provide an imaginary perspective from which to establish the contingency of the history of women's oppression. Debates have emerged over whether pre-patriarchal cultures have existed, whether they were matriarchal or matrilineal in structure, whether patriarchal could be shown to have a beginning and hence be subject to an end. Judith Butler is talking about sort of a Garden of Eden time, a time before patri uh, patriarchy. You see the same thing in the development of uh, human rights with Rousseau and things about the social contract, a time in nature, a, a, a romanticized view of the past before society corrupted us, before things made us bad. So Judith Butler is suggesting in this thing that this idea of a pre-patriarchal society is very uh, attractive, perhaps, because if something has a beginning, therefore it can have an end. And when we look at Schiller, in common understanding among some Korean people, the Schiller dynasty is a place of non-patriarchal uh, existence. It's a place where women had higher status. So today, it's often looked back upon as a time of when women had higher elevated status. And we'll look at some of the reasons for that and some of the reasons why that may be true or why that may not be true. Uh, Judith Butler says this. The very notion of patriarchy is threatened to become a universalizing concept that overrides or reduces distinct articula articulations of gender asymmetry in different cultural contexts. What she's saying in this first paragraph is that if the term patriarchy is used, it reduces the idiosyncratic, the specific manifestations in different cultures. For example, Korean patriarchy today might be different from Korean patriarchy in the Schiller dynasty might be different from American patriarchy, French patriarchy, German, Costa Rican, Peruvian, and such forth. That by having a one-term catch-all, it uh, reduces a more sophisticated understanding and cultural nuances and differences that arise in different cultural contexts. This is where, for example, you would get elements of sort of post-colonial feminism coming into that argument. The self-justification of a repressive or subordinating law almost always grounds itself in a story about what it was like before the advent of the law and how it came about that the law emerged in its present and necessary form. The fabrication of those origins tends to describe a state of affairs before the law that follows a necessary and linear narrative that culminates in and thereby justifies the constitution of the law. The story of origins is thus a strategic tactic within a narrative that by telling a single authoritative account about an irrecoverable past makes the constitution of the law appear as a historical inevitability. This is a very interesting thing. It's what we've already looked at in terms of origins, but it tells a unilinear linear narrative that this had to happen. The power is in place because Without that power, there would have been chaos, there would have been disaster, it was necessary for whatever reasons. People justify their positions of power through narratives. 
uh, and the final one. The postulation of the before within th feminist theory becomes politically problematic when it constrains the future to materialize an idealized notion of the past or when it supports, even advertently, the reification of a pre-cultural sphere of the authentic feminine. This recourse to an original or genuine femininity is a nostalgic and parochial idea that refuses the contemporary demand to formulate an account of gender as a complex cultural construction. The reason I am introducing Judith Butler, and we'll, we'll move into Korean history now, is as I said, the Schiller dynasty with their three queens, with the modern representations, with the dramas, with what you'll hear in a lot of the public discourse, is that the Schiller dynasty was a place during which women had far greater power, freedom, and such forth. Is this a romanticized view of the past? Is this what Judith Butler would sort of talk about, this before, this kind of pre-patriarchal, and then you can find, therefore, somewhere in history where it went from the Schiller dynasty, which was good, the modern society, which is perceived as bad, there must be a point in there somewhere where upon which it flipped and went bad. Therefore, if you can find that point, address that point, then you can also end that point. So by postulating a before, you find the beginning, you find the end. <clears throat> this is a general understanding of Schiller. If you have questions, yes, please. Uh, uh, this bit, uh, very sorry to bother that, that, that's you. Fine. So this is the Wi-Fi connection. So yes. if you need a Wi-Fi for the students for the class, you may let the students log in. Okay. So this is the ID and password. Yep. So you can just kind of uh, yeah, pass yeah. it out. I will just You're afraid of the camera, I think. No, you no, keep no, standing no, no, outside. You don't want to bother your class. Sorry. It's, <laughs> it's totally fine. Um, will we pass this back for Donna, sure. please? And then if anybody else needs it, they can use it. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a very good idea. It's a big, long list of instructions. Uh, are you able to share it with them, Donna? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll write it on the board in a minute. <coughs> this is a general understanding of Schiller, 57 BC to 935. The kingdom of Schiller granted women considerable, considerable rights. Females were not solely viewed as secondary citizens, and many women made considerable political and domestic contributions. Unlike later periods, Schiller women were not confined to their homes. They largely contributed to the tax and labor force, and lower and middle class women, regardless of marital status, often worked in agriculture and assisted their male relatives in learning trades. Families subs subsequently traced both male and female lineage, and women could not be divorced for failing to produce a male heir. Oh, in Korea, this idea of lineage, so here we have this jokpo. Lineage is really important in South Korea. Or in East Asian Confucian societies. Lineage being not a computer game, but the line of your family tree. It's very, very important for South Koreans. So we learn about the origin of the park people coming from an egg being found. Now, this is an example uh, of a jokpo. Many families keep these. My Korean family has one of these. At some points in history, women were erased from these. So around 1600, 1700, in the Joseon dynasty, when Confucianism became Neo-Confucianism, this is when um, the Mongolians took over China. Korea was worried about the sort of, uh, the, their state would lose, they would become barbarians. And so they became even more religiously fanatic towards Confucianism, even more patriarchal in the 16 and 1700s. And at that point, women were not permitted to be on the family record. If somebody died, women could not inherit anything. During the Schiller dynasty, it was perfectly normal. It's perfectly normal for man or woman to uh, be allowed to inherit things. Again, part of the general understanding of Schiller before we get a little bit more in depth. Schiller noble women. 
What was the ranking system called in Schiller? Anyone remember? Bone, bone, bone rank. rank, yeah, excellent, thank you. The bone rank system, a caste system. It's really important. The noble women also enjoyed considerable influence. Three women, Sondo, her cousin directly after Jindo, and then Jin Song, towards the end of the Schiller. You'll notice this was when uh, Schiller was in great disrepute. The Schiller dynasty was just about to fall. It was going to become the Goryeo dynasty. They were going to overtake the whole peninsula. You have three queens here. Um, you don't have queens during any of the other dynasties, right? There's no queens during the Joseon dynasty, really. There's no queens during the Goryeo dynasty. We find three queens during the Schiller dynasty in this kind of 200-year period. And that's why people look back to it as a time of equality. In Japan, just next door, and Japan and China have great influence on what happens on the Korean peninsula. We know for Schiller to unify the whole peninsula, it united with the Tang Dynasty in China. Eight women have been emperor in Japan. Uh, what I find interesting is around similar times here, look, there's a big gap um, of almost 100 years where you have none. But in this period here, this period here, and if you look at the Korean, they're kind of similar, these time periods. So my question is, what is going on there that causes this to happen here and across the water this to happen here in this? So we sometimes see, for example, the rise of similar ideas. If you look at sort of um, Buddha and Jesus Christ and Confucius and Plato, all coming around at similar times, right? So it seems to be that there are points in history where different theories or there seems to be some uh, continuity of ideas existing. Like it, it, it doesn't exist in a linear trajectory that goes like this, but it goes around in phases and you'll get these points where it seems like history is with a capital H, right? Pivotal moments in history. Sometimes you live for a few years and it feels like a decade. Sometimes you live through decades and nothing happens. That's how history works. But in Japan, um, all of them verified in history, none of these mythical. But as I said, one, two, three, four, five, six of these uh, eight empresses or emperors at a very similar time. So what is it that's happening there? Is that part of a broader understanding in East Asia of equality? Is that the way it was naturally and then things were shut off? Or is this a peak point? There are two different ways of looking at that. Is that sort of a peak point where it's reached and achieved this kind of equality? Or was that the natural way and then it dropped down afterwards? Um, Taylor? Yeah, I just have a quick question. So yes. Um, if we're thinking of it as like it being a peak point where equality for between men and women was more accepted, yes. why was it that China was so adamant that the not to work with Korea at the time when they had a queen? Like what, what do you think, like were they also not working with Japan at the time? Like was it... Mm -hmm. Or was it just for Korea that they kind of like It's a very difficult question, and I can only offer, let's say, an idea right. without... Um, uh, one of my suggestions, the first way that I would think about this, would be that South Korea, well, Korea and Japan would have had stronger influences of, let's say, Buddhism, Shintoism, less influence at this time of Confucianism. I would, I, I see, can I just finish my train of thought and then I'll come to you, I, I do see that hand. Also I would suggest, and, and, and this is kind of giving a spoiler to, to what happens, why Sondok and Jindok and Jinsong were able to become queens according to some people, is that the class system was most important. So it wasn't that they were women, it was that the class system was in place and it didn't matter if they were a man or woman, they were in that elevated class system. So therefore, they could become the ruler. So, uh, for example, in the United Kingdom, we have Queen Elizabeth II. It's simply because if there's, it's not like, 
a normal person could become king or queen. As long as you're in that system, regardless of whether you're a male or a female, you're an elevated status. So I think religion, Taylor, would play a part, whereas Confucianism at these times would be less strong, especially during the Shilla. Buddhism was much higher than Confucianism. And also I would suggest because of the strength of the caste system, whereas China might have had a more, um, it, was, it was, had a longer history of the meritocratic state exam which kind of loosened the caste system a little bit. Does that answer your question? Do you have any thoughts or any? Um, I, I, I think I agree with that. I don't think um, I have anything to say. Okay. Please remind me your name. Oh, Stella. Stella. I, sh I was going to say Stella. Stella. Oh, I was um, actually, what, um, do you know what was it here? Was it here? Did you tell me something? Possibly, yes. I, I can't look it up. Can you go? <laughs> Let's Google it at break time, yeah? It, It's always the way, isn't it? Right? It's always the people you've got to look for. So, okay then, great point, Stella. So if it was happening at similar times in China, I think that gives us more reason to start investigating why is it at this time you could find uh, women rulers in all three. Why do you think, Stella? Yeah, it could very well be shifting cultural values. That happens. Culture is not static, obviously. It goes back and forward. It would be wrong to assume, I think, that culture always improves, always gets better. Rather, it ebbs and flows and goes in such a way. <clears throat> so if you can remember this kind of basic idea, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this, but um, my drawings are also very bad. Schiller... Bekje and Golgurio, right, the Korean Peninsula, three kingdoms. Also, down here, you'll have Gaia and Pale, three kingdoms. To unify the whole peninsula, and it left out bits of Manchuria when it did, this involves a lot of territorial expansion. So imagine that you're just confined to the southeast part of the land, but eventually you're going to unify for the first time this whole Korean Peninsula. To do that, you need to expand your base. So the base is down in Gyeongju, right? It's down there. You've got a capital city, sort of right down here in the corner. But you want to rule the whole thing. It would make more sense if your capital was in the middle, right? But it's not. It's down here. To do that, you need to stretch out. You need to create administrations far away and you need to create people and villages in towns like that to do this requires bureaucracy it requires paper it requires taxes right it requires you to manage because you're not managing just a simple geographic area that you can see it's very difficult to imagine what it's like to run a country today imagine what it was like before twitter before smartphones, before communication. We're talking smoke signals, horses, right? Records being burned. So this involved a lot of bureaucracy. This is one of the ideas, actually, of Max Weber, the German sociologist, that modernization involves bureaucracy. Modernization, progress, and going forward requires there to be in an area everybody has the same rules, has the same policies. So it doesn't matter if you're born on the East Coast or the West Coast, you can go over there and you can exchange your driver's license, you can get a job, you can speak the same language. That's all the power of bureaucracy. To achieve this, 
Schiller uses a lot of prisoners of war from Gorgorio and Becte, and also slaves. So it starts sending slaves, prisoners, unfree people around the country to fill it out, to expand its rule. <clears throat> when we sort of think of Schiller was a nice time or time of equality amongst gender, for example, it was for the aristocracy. It was for the ruling classes. For the common people, it was very, very hard. Now, the common people don't write history. The common people at that time, I don't say common people as a negative prerogative, by the way, it, it, the non-ruling class, they didn't write history. Time was very hard for them. They were enslaved. The aristocracy lived lives of singing and dancing. The other people didn't. So during this time, social class divisions widened. Right? So as people become more powerful and start to unify and the elevation of the king and the queen increases, that, cre that creates a greater dichotomy, a greater social gap, a greater power distance between the people. What do people do sometimes when they feel that life is futile, when they feel that existence doesn't matter? They turn to religion. The religion that they turned to at that time was pure land Buddhism. So we know that Buddhism came into South Korea, came into Korea. We know that it came through Nepal, and we know that Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism are different. In, in Korea, the type of Buddhism is the communal Buddhism. It's not the type of Buddhism where you attain enlightenment by yourself, by sitting under a tree. Korean Buddhism is the type where you get together and help each other. This evolved during the Schiller dynasty into a term of pure land Buddhism. And this is a type of Buddhism that doesn't require you to understand abstract esoteric theories. Consider the difference, for example, between Catholicism and Protestantism. You know, Catholicism with all the, the Latin and the Mass and very difficult and the, and the priest and as an, a mediator between you and God and then the Protestant revolution, uh, Reformation with Martin Luther. Anybody can do it. Pure land Buddhism is like that. Anybody can do it. Idea. You don't need to understand difficult concepts. You just need to understand this. Namo Amitabha which is just chanting the name of the God, chanting the name in which you believe. And as the inequalities got harder, alienation became stronger, people turned more and more to Buddhism. They started focusing on the next world, the other world. This is pointless. We've got no freedom, we've got no hope, we've got no future, we'll turn to the next life in order for salvation and respite. So it's really, it, and this is something, if you go to any temple today, you'll hear this, right? It's a really common chant. I encourage you while you're here to go to some temples if you can, regardless of your own religious beliefs, just because it's interesting. And <clears throat> think about this. The rise of Buddhism in South Korea comes from ruling classes exploiting the poor. That's weird. Because you might think of religion as providing comfort and, or religion as sort of indoctrinated, whatever you want to think about, right? But it's one of these things of like unintended consequences. Well, how did that arise? It wasn't intended. People didn't intend to spread this form of Buddhism, which has lasted for 1,500 years on the Korean peninsula. It wasn't a plan. It wasn't nefarious. If it was, it probably wouldn't have worked, which is the interesting thing, right? If you have a plan to achieve something like that, it might not work. What achieved the prevalence of Buddhism in South Korea up until, let's say, 50 years ago, it's really kind of dwindling now, was probably ruling class exploitation. Confucianism comes in. Slowly, we're, we're talking sort of 700 
800 yeah, AD. Confucianism comes in, and in Confucianism there is this idea of a meritocratic state exam where you study and there are exams and you go and sit the exam and if you pass then you can become a government official. Theoretically it's open to everybody. Of course it's really hard if, you, if you're a farmer or if you've got 15 children to find the time to study. So it still favours the more privileged. Nevertheless it gives a way to transcend that hereditary lineage bone rank system. So Confucianism is subversive in Korea at the time. Now this is an idea that I, I, I want to come to, but at the time Confucianism challenges hereditary rank. Confucianism also challenges uh, Pure Land Buddhism. It comes in and says, no, everything's not futile. You can achieve it. Learn the classics. No, these people will not be rulers forever. We can also be rulers if we study and pass the exams. So what I take from something like this, and I, I think the same also applies to Christianity in South Korea, would be this, is that during the sort of, as, as the Schiller dynasty continued and the division between the ruling class and the common people became greater, at that time, Confucianism was very progressive. At that time, Confucianism was a, was a subversive tool to the state. At that time, Confucianism, if you want to think about it in Hegelian terms, was the antithesis. Right? Confucianism was the thing that challenged. Now, if you ask people, Confucianism will be the thing that holds the country back. Confucianism will be the thing that needs to be overcome. So it's not about the specific nature of Confucianism itself, but rather the time in which it exists and the effect that it has. Because the same idea can be very progressive in this time and subversive, and then at another time in history, Confucianism can be very limiting. I think similar things have happened to Christianity in Korea. Towards the end of the Joseon dynasty, so you're looking sort of 1800s, early 1900s, Christianity was, the Christian missionaries to Korea educated women, educated the poor, educated the sick. That wasn't happening at the time, right? Nobody was educating women at the time. Mary Scranton built Iwa Women's School, first one. First school for women. They built hospitals, right? So the Christian missionaries came at that time were really progressive, really subversive. Fast forward 100 years, 120 years, and you'll get a different view of the same idea. Right? This will be seen by some people as like restricting or standing in the way of progress. So it's not about the idea itself. It's about the effect that it's having, whether it's the antithesis or the thesis, right? whether it's working for or against. So Confucianism at this time was a big challenge. I'm going to have a look at some ideas from Sukja Cho, looking at gender equality, um, looking at the Samguk Sagi as well. Again, this is all online and I'll, I'll give it to you at the end of the week. So the Samguk Sagi and the Samguk Yusa, like two of these are the two books that record all of this pre-Korean history. The discussion of women in the Sanguk Sagi helps us to reconsider the dominant view that Korean women enjoyed relatively more freedom during the Three Kingdoms period and the Goryeo era, a period dominated by Buddhism and shamanism rather than Confucianism, the dominant ideology following the Chosun period. So Confucianism, Buddhism, shamanism like the indigenous way and then later christianity four really powerful ideologies competing with each other in the korean land and in the minds of the people and for power right this, this view supposes that korean women's status became restricted in proportion to the increasing influence of neo-confucianism which began 
13th and 14th centuries and really extended during the 17th and 19th, as I mentioned earlier. Though this view is complicated and further nuanced by recent studies, the dominant role played by Neo-Confucianism in controlling and pressing women during the Chosun dynasty cannot be denied. To the eyes of modern Koreans, the Confucian scholars of Chosun were guilty of Shinocentrism, female oppression, class, and gender discrimination. Okay. This is the interesting part from this article, I think. What she's looking at here is that in the Samguk Sagi, there is no difference, like in terms of Hanja, in terms of the Chinese characters used for kings and queens, there's no difference given to the kings or the queens. They're given the same rank, the same status. So it doesn't create a specific section for women. It doesn't create a specific title for them. It just gives their class rank. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that their rank is more important than their gender. The queens in Schiller weren't queens because they were quit. They were just the same as the kings, actually. They were given the same title. So you have what's called here a lack of categorical separation because greater emphasis on class than gender. There is no difference between the kings and the queens. There is no sense of obligation to add words such as great or woman. These days we do, actually. When we look back, we will say, Sondo Yo Wang, we'll use Yo Wang, Yo being woman, Wang being king. In the historical books, this study says, there's no differentiation. It's just like ruler, it's just emperor. Doesn't matter if they are male or female. So to look back at it and to, to see it as a time of a time in which gender was in a better position would perhaps be the wrong view. It's a time during which class was really serious. So I showed you pictures how what they wear determines their separation. Um, this is one of the writers of the Samguk Sagi, Kim Fu Shi, says this. It's not very nice. He's running his time. Speaking from a perspective of the principle of heaven and earth, Yang is strong and Um is weak. Speaking from a perspective of human beings, men are high and women are low. Then how could they let the old woman come out of her inner quarter and be in charge of political affairs? The fact that Schiller took a woman to the throne really can be found in times of chaos. It is fortunate, therefore, that Schiller was not ruined for this. So how was Kim Bushik interpreting the rule of women during the Schiller dynasty? Well, he was doing it based on yin and yang. Um yang, in Korean would be um yang. The idea of dual arising, that the world is composed of two competing forces, night and day, good and bad, men and women, chaos and all. This was the predominant ruling thing at the time. This is how they would understand the world. The interesting thing about Taoism is that this is, as soon as you create division, you remove yourself from the truth. Taoism is seeing the unity behind everything. Right? Taoism is not seeing the, the black and the white. Taoism is seeing everything as the same. However, y yes. No, please ask now. I want oh, some coffee. Okay. Mm. Well, it's, it's just like a recent statement that I'm thinking about. So, um, if you think about like in anthropology, the aspect, the idea of having like an inner and outer sphere where women are in the inner sphere and outer, and men are in the outer sphere. Like men go out into the work, into the workplace, and they take they all things that they do happen outside of the home. Mm -hmm. And for women, what we do is inside the home. And so mm -hmm. you see the kind of and like if we're usually considered like. You do the things during the day, and then men do things during the night, like when they come home from work. But to see it being like females, were women being like negative, and then having like night as our, as like the something that describes it is really just kind of strange to me, because usually it's like women take care of the kids in the, during the day, and then the fathers come home and take care of it. So it's just that aspect kind of is interesting, because I also think about like night, and when you're talking about women, a lot of people like think women of the night, like that's 
costumes and stuff like that, like how we're outside. Mm. And so to have them to get together on that, like compared to the men's side, is so interesting. Why, very good. I, I think you raised some interesting points, Taylor. Why would people, why was this a common belief system? Why would this, this sort of uh, dual concepts, you know, it, this is still on the Korean flag today, by the way. It's red and blue, and you don't have these on here. It, it's a very powerful symbol in East Asia. Why would people have come up with this? Why would people have decided to, why would people have wanted to understand the world in this way? So not whether it's right or wrong, but what would have been the situation that caused this to arise? Alexandra? Mm -hmm. I, I def yeah, very good. I definitely think, Alexandra, that it's easy. I definitely think we, um, f so yeah, you, you, you do allow scapegoats, you do allow, but I, I think in this as well, and this is not me advocating this thought system, by the way, but you realize that without the night, you can't have the day, without the passive, you can't have the, the it, to see, they require each other. But I think the thing about this was, is that it's simplistic. It's a simplistic worldview. It's not based on science, it's not based on nuance, it's not based on experimentation. It's based on, well, where does the sun go? Like at night time, where does the sun go? Koreans used to believe that it sort of went under the sea. And when an eclipse came, it was a snake fighting with the, the, the moon, right? We, we kind of now know that the earth revolves around the sun, right? It took us a long time to understand these things. Imagine in this kind of society, we have to go into their mind, well, how would they explain to their children what happens at night time? Where does the sun go? What happens next year? What happens? This was just a very simplistic way of understanding the natural world around them to use two, to use binary. And you notice that they, they kind of complete each other. So there was a division. There is a division. Yin and yang, male and female, strong and weak, rigid and tender, heaven and earth, light and darkness, thunder and lightning, gold and warmth, good and evil. The interplay of opposite principles constitutes the universe. There's an old story that I was once told. Um, let me see if I can remember it. About a farmer who loses his horse. You might have heard this story before, but I'll tell you. Anyway, this is the idea of interplay between opposites, okay? To, to try to uh, give it to you in a different way. Farmer loses his horse, and his neighbor, let's imagine he's a Korean farmer, right? Chosen. His neighbor comes to him and says, ah, oh, you lost your horse. That's really unlucky. I, I feel sorry for you. Farmer says, good or bad, who knows what it is, right? We can't tell. Good and bad come together. The next day, his horse comes back with three horses. And the neighbor comes back and, wow, you're really lucky. Now you've got three horses, man. Well done. He's like, yeah, but good and bad, they're kind of always going together. We don't know what's what. His son is riding on one of the new horses, falls off and breaks his leg, can't work in the field. Same neighbor comes back. He's a really nosy neighbor, always coming in. <laughs> neighbor comes back and says, that's really unlucky. Now you've got no one to work the field. Same response, good or bad, they come together. Who knows? The next day, the military man comes around recruiting people for the war. The kid's got a broken leg, can't go. So he's saved. Good or bad, who knows? This idea that things are intertwined, that things are connected, right? So what we have in a... <clears throat> am I going to be able to explain? I'm not sure how well you can see this. Um, 
in a scientific and let's say Western view, let's say we have a tree, right? This is a tree. It's a really bad tree, but it's a tree. The Western view of science likes to delineate and mark and create species. The scientific view likes to pigeonhole things, likes to put things into species, right? So we go from the, the mammal down to the canine, down to the dog, down to the shih tzu, down, right? So it's demarcating, drawing smaller and smaller boxes. So you go from the atoms to the molecules, down, down to the quarks and the things that you can't see and string theory and I don't understand it. Science likes to demarcate things into smaller and smaller boxes. The opposite view of that Life doesn't exist in small boxes, right? So what we have here is, is just a tree. And then the moon, and it's all connected. We're going to try to have a look at this concept here. And Stella, do you know how to pronounce this character? Me too, but I'm trying. All right, so in, in, in Korean, this would be... Oh, Anita. Oh, Anita. Sure. Sure. Okay, excellent. Thank you. One more, <laughs> one more time for me, Anita. Sure. Sure. Okay. So in, in Korean, sure. Right? So that there are similarities in it, right? This is really important. Sure. Right? Sure in English is filial piety. Filial piety. Basically, respecting your parents. I know many Korean people who will not follow their dreams because they have to respect their parents, who will not vote for who they want to because they have to vote for who their parents say. Filial piety is a very important thing here, and it has been for a long time. The entry of women into the histography seen in the Samguk Sagi is a modest one, reflecting the vestiges of female invisibility and silence in history. Most of the women who were described in the biographies tend to have two significant events and obligations during their lifetime. First, marriage, and then caring for the parents. Womanly virtues are revealed through their management of various situations, conflicts and obligations. But they are always, uh, in these tales, they're always solved by female characters using filial piety. So there are always dilemmas. Should I do this or should I do that? The answer is generally found in filial piety. So when we have this, it creates opposite virtues, opposite standards, opposite measures to which you should be. So for the uh, female or for the women characters in this, passive, intuitive, soft. It creates standards, like a kijum, a standard to be adhered to. And then this is then reflected in the tales. Because tales are always exaggerated. The kings are never really that clever. They're just normal people. But they become exaggerated. The warriors, of course, are brave. But they're not like Arnold Schwarzenegger in a movie or something. or like, uh, Avengers. They're kind of normal people, but they become exaggerated. So all the characters in these stories become exaggerated. So this exaggerates these virtues. This is something to... You can't say no to your parents in Korea, really. It, it, it just doesn't work. But it, it's really difficult. The relationship between the, the parents and the child... So traditionally, when the parent dies, the children are not allowed to cut their hair, cut their nails for three years. Because that's how long the children relied on the parents. So for the first three years of your life, you can't do anything. Right? You rely on your parents. So when your parents leave, um, when they pass away, you're not meant to cut your nails or your hair for three years. Some people just do sort of three months now three weeks or three days. Because your parents gave you your body, you're not allowed to get tattooed either. Like, your body doesn't belong to you, it belongs to your parents. 
which is really interesting to know that today in South Korea, more women than men have tattoos because it's a rejection of this kind of Confucian idea. Five relationships. Five relationships. You, your friends in Korean society are determined by age. If you were Korean, you would not be able to call me David. You wouldn't be able to use my name. It's strange, but you would not be able to say my name. If, to say the name of an elder person in Korean is completely disrespectful. You don't say their name, you use a title. Yosunim, Songseng-nim, Bujang-nim, Shiljang-nim. You cannot say their name in Korea. So there are five relationships that govern the whole of society. These five relationships, four out of five are hierarchical, which means four out of five, there's always an upper and a lower. The one that is based on friends, this is the only non-hierarchical one, friend and friend. Friends are determined by the same age. So a Korean person might ask you, how old are you? It's one of the first questions a Korean person will ask you, how old are you? Why? Because they need to work out, am I above you or below you, right? And if you get that thing where you're the same age, they go, ah, oh, so we're friends. <laughs> you're like, really? I don't, I don't even know you. Why are we friends? Friendship is determined based on age, being born in the same year. Every other relationship in, in, in Korea is hierarchical to this day. This influence is still so strong today that you do not, like if an elder person is talking to you, you're not meant to look them in the eye. Right? So I, I grew up in a society where you're meant to stand up and look people in the eye and be strong and do this. South Korea, it's the exact opposite. So when I meet my managers and things like that at university, I have to genuinely be smaller. <laughs> I genuinely make myself smaller, look down, never say their name. The parent and the child. Obviously, the parent is higher than the child. The ruler and the minister. Right? The king and the worker the boss and the employee, the husband and the wife, the elder and the younger sibling. All of those relationships are hierarchical. Still really strong today. And so there is a theory behind it. There is a theory behind this, which is the Orion, which is that if the parent treats the child with affection, then this will create harmony. If the king acts in righteousness, he will get loyalty. If the husband and wife differentiate their roles, right? So the, op the idea here is bubu uh, yubyo. You'll find that if they differentiate their roles, there will be harmony. If the elder and younger siblings have precedence, right? So the older brother chooses the chicken first, right? You get fried chicken, you have to wait for the order of age. If you have precedence, there will be affection. This still really strong today. I can't emphasize this enough. It's really hard to break these rules. They're so ingrained. They're not perceived as like following Christianity or Islam or sort of, you know, bowing to Mecca 5. It's not perceived like that. It's just so ingrained into the psyche today. But it has an origin. And the origin of these coming into society was sort of based on, as I said, Shila Buddhism, bone rank, very strong, Confucianism is coming in, and at the time it's seen as a challenge, a progressive, like it's, it's kind of punk. Uh, it's really weird to call Confucianism punk, but at the time it was kind of counterculture. Um, we've had a look at this. Now, so I showed you a little bit of this great Queen Sondok, right? We saw Michel. This lady in the beginning. This paper here says that Queen Sondok, which had like 40% of the population, this was a time before Netflix, right? 40% of the population were watching that drama at the time. That's a lot. That's everybody watching the same drama. This drama, according to Son byung -woo, features the amalgamation, the combination of a small, anguished, modern ego and the ancient hero who pursues a big dream. Therefore, 
Historical drama Queen Sunduk can be regarded as an imaginary memory that reflects the desires of modern people. This is basically the same what we learned from E.H. Carr, that when we see Sunduk presented in dramas like this and in images like this, some people are suggesting that it's reflecting the desires of modern people rather than the historical reality. There are two types of tales related to Sundok. We had this same kind of thing with uh, Tangun. We have the peony tales, which are like flower tales, which depict her queen qualities, and the jigui, which depict her womanly qualities. So these are kind of, most of these are in common understandings. If you ask people in Korea that have a basic understanding of Korean history, they will know some of these tales and they feature in books. My children have some of these books, okay? So, she's a queen or she's a woman? Who is Sondok? Is Sondok a queen or is Sondok a woman? Well, different people focus on different sides, like we have with Tangun the myth, Tangun the halabodi, or Tangun the real person. Sondok is a confusing thing for people. So, we have peony tale number one, and these are kind of like these flowers here. There are three tales that show her skill as a queen. The first one is that when she sent um, some flowers, she sent a painting and she sent some seeds from China, isn't it? Yes, from the Tang. And she looks at the painting, and she, oh, it's a very nice painting, and then they go and plant the seeds. And as they're planting the seeds, uh, Sondok Yowang, Queen Sondok says, these flowers have no smell. Everyone's like, yeah, but we've just planted them. How can you know they have no smell? What are you talking about, Queen Sundok? The flowers grow, and lo and behold, the flowers have no smell. How did you know this? You're so amazing. When I looked at the picture, there were no butterflies or bees around the flowers in the picture. Therefore, things aren't attracted to them. Therefore, she was, she's depicted as like this kind of Sherlock thing. I don't know if you've seen the BBC drama Sherlock or that kind of stuff where they... They deduce and they infer. They have a, a logical intuition. This is the first tale that's attributed to Queen Sondok, that she was able to look at an image and determine the reality of these flowers because of the absence of butterflies and uh, bees. It's also considered perhaps a, what would it, a criticism against her for not having children, that she isn't a fertile flower that she doesn't attract uh, things to pollinate her. A very sort of graphic image, but this one shows her abilities as a ruler. She's able to see the future. She's able to infer by looking at pictures of flowers. Notice the first one is not her slaying her enemies in battle. The first quality associated with Queen Sondok of Schiller is her ability to deduce the uh, smell of flowers. The second one does have a military aspect to it. So this involves these frogs here, right? And now there's frogs every day by the pond. Ribbit, 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 ribbit. Frogs croaking. Queen Sondok deduces from this that there is an army coming to invade. And so she tells her soldiers, please go down to this pond. You'll see some people there, and when you see them, kill them. The soldiers go down there. They find the army. They kill them. They find even more. They kill them. Whoa, so she saved the day by interpreting the croaking of frogs, by interpreting nature. So... It's not based on interpreting the stars. It's not based on looking up there, right? So it's not based on looking at the heavens. It's not based on sort of logic or, or rationality. It's based on understanding nature and the connections to them. Understanding the connection between the butterflies and the flowers, understanding the connection between the frogs and the river that are associated with her qualities. Um, here. This shows that the Queen was well versed in the philosophy of yin and yang. We also see the Queen's reference to the symbolic death of the male during the act of love. So 
She understands the interplay of nature. These are the first two. There's one more associated. It's related to her death. This one's a bit sort of more esoteric and harder to understand. But she says, when I die, bury me near the Doriton, which, includes, which refers to a certain level of heaven. Later, decades after her death, they construct another level here. So we'll look at these pagodas that she built, which are the levels of heaven. So if you consider, for example, uh, Dante's Inferno and the levels of hell and going down and down, here it's talking about the levels of heaven going up and up, probably influenced by the bone rank system that there are various levels of heaven and you can go higher and higher to the sky, higher and higher up the class system. So when she said, uh, bury me near the Dorichon, it played out a, an old Buddhist saying that said, the Sachon one is above, or is below the Dorichon. It's very hard to understand here, but her prediction came true. So there are three tales associated with her with being a good ruler. There are some tales associated with her of being a woman. So we have Sondok the ruler with her three tales. And we have Sondok the woman. Sondok the woman who falls in love with Jigui. Jigui is the kind of um, <clears throat> crazy peasant boy. Depicted in various things, in cartoons and uh, dramas and things like this. There's Digui, there's Digui, there's Digui. It's an interesting thing, like when I showed you Sondok, different pictures of her, always looks very similar. When I showed you Tangun, all the Tanguns look very similar. Digui, this is Digui. So if you ever see anything like this, you might consider, ah, oh, that's probably a play on this idea of Digui. Now Digui, low social status, the first tale, is that like he does nothing but call the queen's name all day. Sondoka, Sondoka, right? That's all he does. Queen goes to a temple. She says, What is this boy doing? He's in love with you. Okay, she goes into the temple. She, she prays. She comes out. She sees him asleep. He was waiting for her. So she places her brooch, her uh, uh, bracelet, on him and then leaves. So he missed it, he fell asleep, right? He had his chance, but while she was praying, he fell asleep. And so she left. And so he turned himself into fire, burned down the temple and killed himself. But that's a story that's well known. You'll see it in cartoons like this. You'll see it in dramas like this. A young boy in love with the queen in love with her so much that he will burn himself and the temples around him because of his love for her. So this portrays her not as the source of action, but rather as the object of affection. There's another one which is similar. He calls her name every day. He's beaten. Eventually his soul becomes a fire spirit and he burns down people's houses. The people were scared of him, so they asked the queen to help. And so she made some talismans. So Sondok is associated with Jigui in this kind of relationship area. This relationship is that he's madly in love with her, can't have her, so therefore burns things. Burns himself, burns houses, burns palaces. I mean, it's quite interesting to think of today. But then, what's the truth of Jigui? Because do we really believe that uh, a, a man was able to set himself on fire? What's the truth of this story? And then why was this story created? Most stories created have a reason for their creation. There's generally something, but so what's the origin of it? But this again, like I say, there you go. Sondok Yoangwa, Queen Sondok and Jigui. We have this on our bookshelf. Uh, Taylor? Yes. Yes. Um, do you think that it may have been created by somebody who wasn't a fan of Queen Sondok being queen? Like you probably feel like so many people who are like, like the guy who was like, oh, when the woman was in charge, it's, it's a miracle that we didn't burn to the ground, you know, like that kind of thing. So do you think it was made by somebody who was like, this is her as a woman. You see how like 
how con not controlling, but like the control that she has on people and how destructive it is. Like, do you think that may have been something that people thought and thus created this? Thing? What do you think? You asked the question. What's your opinion? Uh, I don't know. Um, I I guess I that okay, I think that's probably what it what it could have been because I don't really see the point of making somebody burn themselves alive so many times. <laughs> like if it's just like because they're in love with somebody, I don't think that's. I feel like it's to show like see what women do to men, the, the good men, the nice men, see what they do. And like he's dead now. Like he calls her name every day and he sees death and now he's burning somebody's house down. Like I feel like that's kind of like the path that people would take and it's like this is why you don't trust women. Like that kind of thing. So that's what I get from this stuff. Okay. Good. <laughs> it, um, I see Lana's ha uh, hand first. Yes, Lana. I, I think, Lana, that's a really good point. To w We can't see fire. We have to understand fire through Korean eyes, right? And not only Korean eyes, modern eyes in dramas and things like that, but also the eyes of that time. So all of these concepts have to be understood. And whether that's possible or not, whether you can ever understand it is a different question, but that's a really key point. We have this idea of burning in love, burning up with fire, right? It, it, it's incredibly common in Western culture, but also in Korean culture. And so maybe this is... The origin. So when you have Cupid, when you have Eros, when you have the god of love shooting the things, right? this is the manifestation of love. This is the idea that you would, you would sacrifice yourself for the love of a woman. So maybe, as Taylor said or Lana said, it shows the uh, irresponsibility, the, the, the tale was created to show the irresponsibility of putting a woman in charge. Maybe the, the tale was also created to show the effects of love. You know, Jigui is, people will look at Jigui, remember suicide is incredibly common here. Suicide is seen as a patriotic national duty sometimes, right? It, it's different, it, it, it's different. If you watch a lot of Korean movies, at the end, the hero commits suicide, because that's the heroic thing to do. I couldn't understand this at first. We're like, wow, this is a terrible movie in Korean people, oh, what a good guy. <laughs> really? <laughs> Like, the good guy wins and gets the girl and goes off. And no, 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 this is the good guy. It, it's different. So maybe this plays into the idea of sort of that. that. Um, Alexandra, your hand was up. Yeah, um, I wanted to say that you have, like, Jiggly, and then also you have the fairy tale, because Jiggly is the fairy tale Very good, Alex. I think Jigui could be the butterfly or the bees that were missing in the painting. Yeah. Maybe that's established to say, look, there are butterflies, there are bees around Sundok, and here's one, but they were just stupid and they burnt themselves mm -hmm. on the way. Yeah, um, so on the, I agree with Alex um, and with what, also what Lana said, um, but on the like, topic of like suicide and how it's a, a very, like, I guess, noble or common thing in Korea, I think it, I don't, I don't know for sure, but I don't think they usually burnt themselves alive to commit suicide back then. I feel like it was a more like reserved act, maybe, but not like, or was it like, or was it like a big, like, I know there's like some time where they would do like in a, in a like a uh, common, like a, what is it called? A city center or something like that, mm -hmm. where they would like kill themselves there, but I feel like it, I, I mean, I also remember um, 
like recently and like like in the two thousands, um, in uh, was that Mount Tibet? Was that Yeah, I know that there are a lot of Tibetan monks who would burn themselves alive like in the middle of the city, but I didn't know if like the common if there's a commonality between the way that they would commit suicide in mm. Tibet compared to Korea, especially since the times are different. So I just wasn't sure. I see your hand, Stella. Let me just address this, if I may, please, if that's okay. Um, so when we think of self-immolation from Buddhist monks, one of the common things is the Vietnam War. So in protest against the Vietnam War, many Buddhist monks were setting themselves on fire in the middle of the city. It was the cover of uh, Rage Against the Machine, famous album, Evil Empire. You're probably looking at me going, what's Rage Against the Machine? That's mm -hmm. old. Um, in South Korea in the past 10 years, I think there have been at least like three or four taxi drivers that have set themselves on fire in the city center protesting. More common way is to jump off mountains. So President uh, No Mu Hyun, who's the current president's best friend, he was president uh, from 2002, 2007, he jumped off a mountain. The president. The ex-mayor of Seoul, Park Won Soon, jumped off a mountain about five months ago. Did you die? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That's what happens when you jump <laughs> off a mountain. <laughs> You're both, both dead. So what, the point that I'm trying to say is from the very top level of society to the bottom. And so once these people uh, commit suicide, it, you should not speak ill of the dead, right? So it absolves them. It, it removes the kind of shame. So it's not like, ah, you see, you run away, you're guilty. No, it's the opposite. Like, ah, they did that, so that increases their honor. So it's a very different way of perceiving it. There's a movie called Joint Security Area. It's a 2000 movie. So it, it's 21 years old. Really amazing movie about North and South. The end of that, the lead guy kills himself. And everyone's like, yeah. <laughs> it's strange, though, because if you understand it through our perspective, it doesn't make sense. But if you understand it through a Korean perspective, and if you think that they've grown up with tales like this all the time, and there will be other examples of this, then it's just embedded into the consciousness that they have different associations with concepts and ideas. Um, can I do Stella first? Lama, sorry, Stella. So, like, this kind of honorable suicide is also a pretty common thing to do. Like, people who kill themselves, like, although it's not as common in the current culture because of social media. But also, I think, like, for, like, the burning alive, It's that yin and yang. It's um and yang as well, though, again, isn't it? And I, I can't tell you how many times Korean people have said to me, eat this, eat these foods. They, uh, this, I, <laughs> this might sound a little bit, so this is kind of like a trigger warning, but it happens to me so many times. David, eat this, it will give you stamina. There's a belief that sort of eating animal parts and, you know, whether it's snake alcohol, whether it's oxtail, these kind of things, Putting that inside you will give you energy, will give you virility to produce children and such forth. So there is that inner and outer. <laughs> it's true. It, yeah, it, it happens. I'm sorry, Lana. To I, was, I was curious as to the people who jumped off the mountain. Like, was it a protest or something? Or was it just because they were going to be dumb? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. That was a terrible way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> so... No Mu Hyun, um, I want to say he was the president 2002, 2007. I think those dates are correct. No Mu Hyun, um, he was being, his family was being investigated for corruption and things like this, oh. right? So commit suicide, no more investigation. <laughs> Park Won Soon was the mayor of Seoul. Um, he was very well-respected people's person, the feminist mayor and things like that. Uh, somebody came out and said that he'd been sexually harassing them, sending photos and things like this. He walked to a cliff and jumped off. Investigation closed. That's, that's what happens. 
it, is it the law? Is it, it, it's the culture. It's the culture. So there's been a big uh, scandal recently about real estate, what would you call it, graft, like people using inside information. The people got caught. Suicide. Because it's... Why does this happen? I can't explain why this happens exactly, but let me suggest um, to all of you that, for example, in the West, whatever the West is, we are responsible for our deeds and actions, right? So if, if we do something as an individual, then we are responsible for that action and therefore we should uh, be rewarded or be punished accordingly because we're an individual. In Korea, you are not an individual. You are a member of a family. You are tied, you are defined by your relationships to your father, your mother, your younger brother. There's no individual here. It's not about being an individual. It's about being tied and connected to everybody else. So, but if you are the one that's messing up this, if you go away, this continues. That's the idea of it, right? So you try to absolve the responsibility of your family. You do it, that's why it's seen as a, a good thing. Yes, On this Taylor. Point, this, this may not apply the same way, but you know how like in the United States, if you have really bad debt and you die, it goes on to your family? I Does didn't that know that. But oh, yeah. okay, well now you know. Oh, okay, yeah. If you die, <laughs> your debt, just, like if I have like, Tell a bet my mom or like my husband or whoever gets it, like they get it after I die. So is that not a thing here since you can't like seek God? You can't be like, he still owes me money. You're like, oh, well, I guess I'm out those 50 grand, you know? Like, do, does it just not get passed on? I will Google tonight hella debt in South Korea and, <laughs> <laughs> and see what comes. Uh, uh, yes. Um, okay. Elise? I think that's at the start of the Sweet Home manga as well. Like, the, you know, maybe, maybe. Yeah. I don't read that. <laughs> it was a Netflix. Oh, yeah. It was a Netflix. I, I watched a couple of bits. I always watch like the first three or four episodes, and I'm like, I'm finished now. Yeah, zombies in an apartment building. Oh. Sweet Home is not about Sweet Home. It's about <laughs> zombies in an apartment building. It's quite gruesome. Um, but yeah, suicide over here is very different. So Jigwi, when you see this boy burning in love and killing himself, that's what presidents do. That's what mayors do. That was six months ago. Okay. It is Elise, right? Yeah. Yes. I, this is kind of like a Western understanding. Also, I think it's like a, a quote from a Batman movie, but... <laughs> 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 yes, okay. Two face, yin and yang. Yeah, um yang. <laughs> so I don't know. I was thinking, like, I guess from the like viewpoint of like committing suicide, like being heroic. It's like you're, I guess, killing yourself before like you can become do anything bad. Uh, That's why people in the Twenty Seven Club. You take Tupac. You take Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, or even John Lennon. Right? They didn't get old and make terrible music so people still like them. <laughs> because they would have got older and maybe their music would have gone down. Like when you get as old as me, Elise, I've, I've seen like five different Batmans. They all manifest differently. But yeah, Two-Face, that Harvey Dent character is um and yang. It's the good and bad, it's the Jekyll and Hyde. Jigui's suicide is a noble thing. That's the modern understanding of Jigui. Um, I'm just trying to look how much I've got left before the break. Yes, Taylor. Okay, just quick question. Yes. So you said that Jigui, like his suicide was also noble. So th this is kind of weird. So suicide is um, regarded as noble for whoever does it. It's not just regarded as noble for people who are higher up. It's just right. like, if you do it, you are, it's a noble death to, to like go by. Or is it just like, like how is it perceived? Because when like the two presidents or the president and the mayor committed suicide, it was like, 
um, they were they were getting inter- investigated for doing something bad, and so they killed themselves. And it's like, oh, that's really sad. But with Sigri, was it like, was it also like, oh, that was really sad, or was it like, oh, he was tainted by women, and now he's dead, and that's like, or like, is it is it is it regarded as noble no matter who does it? Like, is it just is it just flat? I, I think it would be incorrect to say that in, in Korean society, if you commit suicide, that's noble. Right. It, it definitely depends on the context. But it, it's far more prevalent and prominent. The number one cause of death amongst South Korean children today is suicide. If I speak to a classroom like this of uh, South Korean students, they will often know somebody from high school that committed suicide. Like, this is a very like, emotional and, and, and dangerous conversation. But consider how many people you might know that have committed suicide. It'd be very low, I, I hope. If you ask a class of South Korean people, they'll be like, yeah, I know one or two. Happens a lot. Probably happens more than we even know because some families might keep it quiet. Nevertheless, it's more prevalent here than in other societies. So I don't think it's always noble. Um, if you're a high figure, it might be a way of escaping blame and, uh, and things like this, but it's just more common. <coughs> Let's finish Queen Sondok, and then we can go to the Hwarang. We'll take a break and then the Hwarang. Um, so, Bidam. Bidam, you have a heavily caste system in Shiva. Aristocrats, kings and queens, really poor people suffering. They're vying for power. The aristocrats, and the, they want to take the power back from the queen. So, Bidam, the female king failed to rule the country, therefore women should stop. So, he's got big political influence. He starts a rebellion against the queen. Bidam is the one that tries to kill the queen. But, he fails. On the night that it's going to happen, Queen Sondok's health falls. A star fi- falls near her residence. Bidam sees this shooting star and says, this is a sign that she's going to fall. Kim Yushin, who's a very famous general, this is Kim Yushin, here. He put a big kite in the sky with a scarecrow. Bidam sees this big kite flying in the sky, burning, and he says the star is back in its place. So the star is used as the fallen queen. He says, let's go and kill her. They put a scarecrow burning in the sky. Ah, the queen is back. Bidam and his 30 followers were executed. There was a plan to kill the queen. Didn't work. However... Sondok eventually dies, 647. Nobody knows the cause of her death and unspecified illness. Perhaps she died of shock. She's buried in a tomb in Gyeongju, the capital of the Shilla in this area, and it would be a tomb that looks like uh, this. Her cousin, Jindok, here in the drama, is the next ruler. So they go from one queen directly to the other queen. She didn't have any heirs, she didn't have a son or a daughter, so it goes to her cousin, Jindok. Again, perhaps not because of gender, but because of class. Although she doesn't live to see the three kingdoms united, she has a legacy. So some people attribute to Queen Sundok the lifting of taxes, uh, the helping of the middle class, helping orphaned widows and elderly citizens. Are these true? Don't know. These are attributed to her, just like they're attributed to other people. These are real, however. These are things that last. A stargazing tower. This is Tomsongde. This assists farmers. So it's able to look at the, the stars and work out the full moons and when they're coming. Here we have Hang Ryong Sa, the Imperial Dragon Temple, nine story pagoda. So when you see these things, This is kind of like we associate with the Shilla area down here. We associate with Buddhism. We associate with levels of heaven going up. So I showed you those rocks last time, stacked, like the photo from Insta, you'll see these things. Um, Here. And these kind of things found recently. This is Buddhist. This is what we associate with the Shilla dynasty. Mm, let's have a look at this last bit before we take a break. In the 27th generation of Schiller, a queen became the sovereign. The queen is virtuous but lacks authority. Because of this, nine neighboring countries or tribes invaded Schiller. 
If we build a nine-story pagoda at Hwangyong Sa to the south of Dragon Palace, disasters caused by neighboring countries will subdue. The first story of the pagoda will subdue Japan, the second story China, the third the Wuye Kingdom, the fourth Panga Island, the fifth story, the sixth story, the ninth story. So each story is a representation to subdue different enemies. If you can build nine, it creates peace. Um, and here you see these pagoda ideas. Right? This is Buguksa in Gyeongju. Again, another, this is unified Shilla, 8th century. This is unified Shilla, 8th century. So these kind of things we associate with Buddhism. We associate with Shilla. Associate with good luck. Um, so it's very interesting, this idea of Sondok, because she can be romanticized into a, a period of sort of equality amongst the Shilla, or it can be seen as a period of very hard class differentiation. The point that I've tried to suggest to you today is that during this period, people turned to Buddhism, the normal people in Korea, they turned to Buddhism because they were suffering so much. So they retreated into Pure Land Buddhism, and that sparked Buddhism in Korea, still strong today. Then Confucianism comes in as a challenge to Buddhism, as a challenge to hereditary bone rank system to try to make it meritocratic, study by merit. Confucianism is seen as subversive. Um, I would like to stop here and then after the break we will... Uh, where did I put that thing? In my pocket? The, the, the clicker, okay, yes. <laughs> I get really confused. And then afterwards, I want to look at the uh, the Hwarang, these things. We'll look at these also. <laughs> this is so popular in Korea, right? <laughs> you need to understand this. We'll talk about this after the break. Does anybody have any questions or comments before we take a break? No, it's definitely break time. Uh, 15 minutes, and then we'll start again. Thank you. So I do understand, like, listening to your interest in suicide and how it plays out today there is a lot that we could understand from un focusing and analyzing contemporary Korean culture. For example, you might look at sort of 600 AD and Shilla dynasty and go, well, how does that help me today? What do I learn about living or working or being in Korea today? So if I find that that kind of uh, focus is more interesting to you, I I'll veer towards that as well. Kind of what... Yes, Stella. Like that? Yeah. Okay. So, amongst many other things that I do, I write a weekly column. So every week in the newspaper, different column. I've written about suicide three times thus far. Um, just having a look at some of this. Um, it's called an extreme decision. Okay. So when people in South Korea commit suicide, it, there's a euphemism. They made an extreme choice, right? Kukan Suntek. That's how it will be described. An extreme choice or an extreme decision. That's a euphemism. So but I, I, for me, the interesting thing, part of that is the idea of Suntek, choice, selection. They made a choice, right? And, but their choice was extreme, but it's there. Um, in the OEC data, maybe I can make this bit bigger for some people. This computer is a bit. Oh. South Korea records more suicides than any other nation in the OECD. It has done since 2003. Modernity and morality go hand in hand. So, as South Korea has become more modern, suicide has increased in prevalence. Why is that? What is the connection between modernity and suicide? In 2018, for every 100,000 people, 26.6 individuals took their own lives, which was an increase. That's quite a big number, 26.6. And they are the official recorded statistics. There will be many more that are not recorded because of embarrassment or, or fear. Teen suicide rates. 
2018, they rose 22.1%. The number one cause of death for young people since 2007 is suicide. It's fascinating. What would drive them to this? What, what is the main cause of the, the stress or why would young people choose this? Taylor? I'm getting to this point and that the pressure is going to go into parentation. Those two things exactly correct. Education and responsibility to your parents. Responsibility to get into a good school, not failing your parents. Education and your filial piety. My nephew is 14 years old. His schedule at his dormitory is 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. When I saw that, I thought it was a joke. It's not. He skips breakfast, so he starts at 7. His schedule is 7 till 11. When he's at home, his mother sits by his computer, makes him study till 1 a.m., 2 a.m. With a stick. This is quite common. Of course, every family is different, but the focus on children's education, the, the, and this goes back to the idea that study, that education is the leveler in society. So rich or poor. Mo Mu Hyun was from a poor farming family. Poor farming family, became the head of the nation. How? Studied all day, took the tests, became a lawyer, got to the top. Education here is seen as the great leveler for better or for worse. And because it's the path to the top, that brings with it a great pressure. And then when you add with that, that filial piety, that you owe it to your parents, that you, you can't follow your dreams, you can't love yourself, be yourself, no, you are your parent's child. That creates a situation where in the OECD, in the world, this country has the highest suicide rates and is the number one cause of death for young people. And that is heartbreaking. And what is being done to change that? And what is being done to address that? I would suggest not enough. Tests here are primarily multiple choice, all taken on one day. So the entrance, university entrance exam is just one day tests, multiple choice, 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. On that day, they stop airplanes flying over the city because they can't disrupt the tests. Airplanes will kind of fly around because you can't be noisy. Taxis and police cars will give children free lifts into school not to miss it. It's huge. What would it be like? 13 years of education all decided on one day of tests. When I grew up, my tests were split up over two weeks. I'd have one test in the morning on Monday, and then on Thursday in the afternoon I'd have a test, and I would kind of have to write. Like, here it's multiple choice, one day. It's essentially an IQ test. Put all this together. Also put together superstitions. Korea is still a very superstitious country. Very superstitious country. They use the word mishin, so you can think of mishin. <laughs> mishin is superstition. They will not eat things like seaweed soup on days of test because seaweed is slippery. Tests will go away. Test scores will run down. Very superstitious when it comes to education. So this kind of, these stories of suicide, this focus on sort of meritocratic education from the arrival of Confucianism, it doesn't exactly explain these statistics, but it does contribute. It does contribute. How much? That's a really difficult question. But most Korean people know that education is very important. In 2018, of the suicides, 72.1% by men, 27.9% by women. Right. So we learn from this statistic that men succeed more, women try more, but they don't succeed. Right. So men succeed more in their suicide. We have this idea of um, I don't know if I wrote about it in here. Mm. 
we have this idea in South Korea of W A N G D D A. W A N G D D A. Wangta, which is kind of like an outsider. It means an outsider, somebody outside the group. Sometimes in the West, we try very hard to be an outsider. When I was 16, 17, I had white hair, I had my nipples pierced, I tried to be m and I was trying to be m and M. I ended up looking like everybody else. But I was trying to be an outsider. I was trying to be different. I was trying to be weird. In South Korea, that's the opposite. Nobody works towards that. You don't want to be the outsider. That the nail that sticks out gets hammered back in. To stand out is a very dangerous thing. You don't draw attention to yourself. Because if you draw attention to yourself, you become the focus of criticism. My wife has been very worried about my increasing presence in the media. Because it brings with it dangers. It brings with it focus. And that can lead to downfall. South Korea, or in here, the idea of being a wanker, being ostracized, being put outside the group, because it's a very collective society, because people believe in the concept of Uri, us, our, we, to become the outsider is very bad. And the only way that people seek to resolve that often is by suicide. It's something that sadly gets a little bit too lost. I mean, in, in, we see it in films, we see it amongst uh, K-pop stars as well. Whether it's uh, Gu Harar or Sally, or, it's very, very common. It's tragic. South Korea, it, it's a good question. I don't have the answers. I, I believe the answers are for Korean people to find for themselves. Um, South Korea, it's important to understand, has experienced compressed modernity. So not only does it have a post-colonial history, where from 1905, it didn't have a country. It was run by Japanese, speaking Japanese, right? So its whole identity gets ripped away. And then for the last 50 years of the 20th century, it's in this kind of cold war. You might still say it's in a process of a cold war. It had military authoritarian rulers. South Koreans could not leave the country until 1990. Couldn't go on holiday. They couldn't get on a plane and go to Germany. They had to ask the government's permission. It's experienced what we call compressed modernity. All this has happened so quickly. Think back to 1950s attitudes in America. You weren't alive at the time, but you can imagine how different it was from today. Things take time. There's this, there's this idea that you'll know of a cultural lag. Economy can change overnight. Politics can change overnight. You can decide, we're going to be a republic. Now we're going to be a democracy. Now we're going to be King David. You can change that just by decrees. You cannot change culture quickly. There is a cultural lag. It lags behind. This is a sociological concept. So this, this, this culture is still lagging. Korea has really done amazing things. Look at, look at the cleanliness of the subway, the buildings, the aircon. The, the 5G, the Wi-Fi, the Samsung smartphones. This sounds like an advert right now, <laughs> right? Yeah. But the culture is still lagging a little bit. But that's to be expected. But then when you get this kind of rise of individualism and social media and put them together, the combination can be lethal. And it's lethal to those, to the young, 
to the vulnerable. And they pay the price. Stella. No, I agree. So if we look back, um, uh, give me one second, sorry. So we have this thing called the four occupations. And in the four occupations, you'll find at the top, Sa, Nong, Gong, Sang. Don't know how to romanize these. Nong, gong, sang. The level of hierarchy of the occupation, sa, is educator, professor, teacher, literati, right? Really high respect. My family cannot imagine ever speaking back to a teacher or a professor. So in the West, in England, if you're a professor or something like that, they'll be like, yeah, yeah, all right. In Korea, people, oh, it's really different. There's, there's very high respect given to those in education in East Asia. It's not just Korea, but in East Asia in general. The four occupations, so this is level one. The number one is to be in education. This is agriculture. Nong is farming. Gong is like manufacturing. This is merchants. Merchants are at the bottom. So when we think traditionally, historically, education is really prized in East Asia. It's seen as something so important. Th for me, a lot of students now are realizing that education doesn't guarantee them the job anymore, though. Youth unemployment is really high. So whereas education used to be so for people in uh, the 60s and 70s and 80s in South Korea, to go to university to get a job, they could go to the top of society through that. The rate at which students go to university now in South Korea is about 9 out of 10. 9 out of 10. If everybody goes to university, that's, you can't get a good job. 9 out of 10. In Germany, it's about 4 out of 10 because you have to get a certain level, right? So nine out of 10 South Koreans are going to university. They go to university, they study French. Oh, are you interested in French? Do you speak French? No, just like this. So this is, it's really hard to read, but yeah, these four occupations, very real. Education is highly prized. Uh, um, I've forgotten your name, I'm sorry. Monterey. Monterey. Is there, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm always willing to find out what you're interested in. Is there anything specific about it or it, what provokes this curiosity that might help me? Um, I just find the education system in the US to be lacking in a lot of areas, so it would be like, interesting to like, know more about this one so I can like, kind of like, compare. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll try to find some time. I've written the syllabus, by the way, but I'll, I will happily change it. Um, let me just give you two kind of outlines between the difference from Western education that I've been part of and Eastern education, which I've been part of here. In, in Eastern education, in a classroom of South Koreans, they don't look at the teacher, they don't speak to the teacher, they keep their eyes down and they take notes. They don't question the teacher, they don't raise their hand to make a point. The teacher has the knowledge, the teacher has the bucket of water and fills up the students with the knowledge. So, for example, uh, can I say this? Yeah. When I found out that I was teaching this class, what happened, or the other professor left and there was something, Korean people I know couldn't believe that people would challenge a teacher. 
And this is not a, a, about you, but it, it's just like, that you can't say that to a teacher. You can't say that to a professor. There is this idea, there is a power distance, okay? So the power distance between the student and the professor is different across cultures. In the West, I could speak to my professor in England and say, shall we go for a beer, John? Like, I can call them by their name. Not all of them, but some I could happily call them by their name. Can't do that in Asia. The power distance, the power gap is really high. Another thing that would be is that in Western education, we encourage people to find the answer within themselves. Like the answer's within you, you've just got to become aware of it. You've got to realize it. We've got to achieve it through a dialectic, through a dialogue. And there might be conflicting answers, but the answer primarily is inside of you. And you will understand your answer by communicating with other people. You will become aware of what was already inside of you. It's very different in Asia. So in Asia it would be, you listen, you understand, you don't respond, you listen passively. So, yeah, we'll look more into that. Education is really different. Uh, one final difference would be this. The smart children in South Korea go to academies. They do extra study. So in high school, in the class, students might just sleep. And once school is finished, then they go to the academy. So the, because in the academy, they're studying three levels higher. So school is a waste of time. So school will just be, yeah, be quiet, teacher. And then they will go to study their academy. So where I'm from, the, I can't say, the students that were struggling had to go and do extra study. Like if you were falling behind, you've got to do a bit more study, I'm afraid, right? In Korea, it's the opposite. The students that are doing well do the extra study. Yes, Elise. Yeah. I, I had to go when I was little until like I, I remember <laughs> yeah, I remember like once I was like at, at like the school and I was like crying because like I didn't finish my homework and they made me stay. And <laughs> they let me leave because I was crying. But um like I think yeah, all of my like my friends and then um my my friends who like it, there's like when you when you're in middle school you uh where you like you can like apply to go to like a high school, and you have to take a test to get in, and it's mm -hmm. like considered like the best high school, one of the best high schools in New Jersey. Um, but then, like a lot of people, like go to like schools to like take a to like um, study to take the test to get into the high school and like to do the interviews and stuff. Um, and then afterwards, like they'll continue like you know doing uh, like math all the time. So they're all they're all like like a few grades of like math like above everyone else. Yep. It's exactly, so that your experience, Elise, is the same, but here it's magnified, yeah. right? The experience here with Hagwon, Hagwon means academy or institute. The students will go to three or four a day. My, if you just let me give this one, Taylor. Um, my, my daughter is five, my son is seven. They do piano and violin four times a week. That's quite a lot, right? That's for two hours. So once they, finish school, uh, once they finish school at four, so my daughter's five years old, I take her like out at 8.30, take her to school. She gets home at six o'clock. That's nine till six, she's five. And I'm like, this is too much. And my wife's like, this is not enough. But, so <laughs> it's, it's a cultural communication, right? We, but this is four times a week and then they do private study. Teachers, it's very common for teachers to go to other people's house in South Korea. It's a huge black market, right? So people, always offering me, David, will you come and teach this person? Will you come and sit down with my son or my daughter for an hour and teach them X, and they give you an envelope full of cash? Yeah, 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 yeah. Government doesn't like it because you can't tax it and it's hidden, but education is really key. And it's, um, what we're also seeing right now is an increase of Ritalin amongst students used as kind of like super study pills so Ritalin and Adderall have found their way into the system now and they're being used to kind of keep students awake. You have to remember these students are just studying rote, right? So it's rote, so it's boring stuff and that, that's how they study. Um, I, I'm sorry, Taylor, did you? I was going to say, um, I know that some schools, like the school that I went to wasn't like the biggest Christian school ever. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so like in elementary school, there are people who were like the students who were like gifted, and so they would have to take like an extra two or three classes, and they'd like leave the class that they're in and be taken to the other class and so they can study. So you have like more assignments to do. And then in high school, there's also like the IB program, which is also like elsewhere. And so we have like all the extra course load plus other classes that we could possibly take. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like it's kind of it's not obviously not as intense, but it's similar to that like where people who are a little bit more gifted or like who have who are stronger in school went to go do more classes and things like that. Yep. Yeah. Also, can I get a vacuum? <laughs> I don't know if I need to ask, but I you don't need to ask. Okay, it, it, it's absolutely. Like, walk out where you're talking. No, no, absolutely fine. Okay. Very good, <laughs> Lana. Um, I guess a question that I have while we're all on this topic of this, like education. Yes. Is why high is being seen? Because it's obviously not a good thing that you know the ones getting shot. Students aren't really going to college, or they're going to college and you know studying whatnot because it doesn't really matter if you know obviously they're going to get a job and you know. I mean, especially, I wouldn't say gay rights because I wouldn't compare, like, the West to be, like, you know, this ideal, because we also have our systems with the SAT and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff, but generally, like, the West way that I went to school was, like, paid for it, and, like you're saying, like, encouraged, like, individual by tax resources, but why hasn't, like, there been shifts in education to change all these, like, really good people to say about? You mentioned, it's a very good question, Lana. You said at the start when it obviously isn't working. Isn't it? I mean, what perspective does one take? If one takes the perspective of cultural, political and economic development, South Korea is kind of unparalleled for a a country this size. So you could approach this as a moral question. How do you feel about this, though, Lana? If If I say to you, I'm just trying to play devil's advocate and I'm trying to suggest to you that it is working. I mean, you're saying it's working in the sense that, like, there is a system and, like, they're following the system, so technically, that much that you're saying. Oh, okay, like, sorry. So, like yeah. Um, 70 years ago, there was nothing on this land. It was bombed, it was destroyed. In the past 70 years, South Korea has overtaken so many other countries to become part of not only the OECD, but let's say maybe the 12th biggest economy in the world. Not only is it the 12th biggest economy in the world, it's cultural products now win Oscars and billboards and charts. Um, It's relatively, it's thriving. And compared to the suffering that it's had recently, they might say, what we're doing right now, let's keep going. My response would be okay, but like, is this idea Is it worth the lives of actual Korean citizens? Like, in terms of, like, I guess their lives, like, are you willing to make that, that risk? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there's, I, I, I see your hand. I'll, I'll come to you in one second. There's a fabulous short story, and I'm not saying it is, by the way. I, I'm trying to approach it for discussion. There's a fabulous short story by Ursula K. Le Guin called The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. Do you know it? Ursula K. Le Guin, the ones who walk away from Amalas, there's a perfect city, society, has religion but not too much religion. It has like happiness and drugs but not too much happiness and drugs. The people live a wonderful life. This story is 30 years old, so it's a spoiler, but please. Um, Below the city, there is a young girl kept in a, a, a room that's not big enough for her to stand up in but not small enough to lie down in. She remembers living outside the room being taken away and put in there. She lives in her own excrement. Keeping her in there prolongs the happiness of the state. To take her out would to fall, make the state fall away. I won't give the ending of the story away, but it comes down to, I guess, in terms of morality or how we approach this in terms of deontology or consequentialism. Something is always right or always wrong, deontology, based on a principle. Something is right or wrong depending on the consequences of that action. So if we were to make a million people happy and one suffered, to some people that would be acceptable. From a consequentialist, utilitarian, sort of Jeremy Bentham enlightenment principle, to the deontologists, that would never be acceptable. So it's kind of how you approach this, and I, I think... Slowly, Korea is changing, but it's cultural lag. 
takes time and we want things to go like this so yeah we will um, uh, sorry your hand was it please remind me your name Anita, Anita. It's a collective viewpoint, isn't it? Yeah. So there have been these studies, let me just follow this from Anita, there have been these studies that have come out where they look at sort of cultural differences and reactions. They take a photo of 100 people and sort of in this photo, 99 people are smiling and one person in the middle is sad. And they ask people from East Asian cultures, tell us about this photo. The East Asian people look at the 99 people and go, this is happy. And people from Western societies focus on the individual that's sad and go, this is sad. They perceive things differently. The sanctity of the individual versus the collective good. There are cultural differences, as Anita says, that yes, people will fall by the wayside, but it's for the greater good. This is not me suggesting that's right, but that's suggesting that is a viewpoint. Call it socialist, call it communist, call it collective, call it utilitarianism call it consequentialism, but there are prices to be paid. And for some people, the, the, the cost is worth it. Because there's this thing in South Korea called um, Hon. Comes from Honja, right, so this is H-O-N. And it first came with this idea of Honbap, H-O-N-B-A-P. Right, bap, bap, he's like bibimbap, gimbap, uh, hon, eating alone, hon bap. It's about five years old. The concept of eating by yourself is about five years old, as a neologism. So there are these new cool terms in Korea. One is called eating alone. <laughs> it exploded on the internet about five years ago. You remember the pagoda? Why am I looking at Richard Rutt all the time? <laughs> <laughs> he wrote a really good piece, by the way, though. Um, so when I showed you, I've lost the pagodas. These kind of pagodas, right? They would have levels of honbap. If you can eat gimbap by yourself, you're level one. Mm -hmm. If you can eat samgipsal, you're level five. If you can drink by yourself. <laughs> right. It's a new, th is your teacher Korean? Yeah. It's a new thing and they're amazed by it. So it's become hon bap, it's become like hong gong, studying by yourself, hon mo yo, like traveling by yourself. Imagine what seems to us so natural, so normal, something that we would not even consider. For the people here, it's a new concept. My brother-in-law is in the South Korean military, he's quite high up. I asked him, do you have hon bap in the military? He's like, don't be stupid. <laughs> We're soldiers. We, we live together, work together, eat together, sleep together, right? Die together, kill together. It's together. Every South Korean male has to do two years in that environment. The idea of the individual is not big here. So what interests me is that this idea, it was sort of birthed in a word, in a term. It was an idea that came into society. And once people named it, so because before Honbap, people sometimes ate alone, sometimes. But once it had a name, once it had been named, this uh, behavior had been given a name, people started talking about it, and then people started doing it. And then people started writing about it, and people started putting it into dramas. So the uh, the individualism was, was prompted by somebody naming this phenomenon in the local language. I Taylor. I think it's really interesting that it's so new because I, I feel like with everybody wanting, but I know it's just 
particularly as like big on community, but like wanting needing to be above others in terms of like your your rank in a class or like how like what school you go to, I would think that more people would be like, I need to do this by myself so that I can get above those who are around me. Mm. And so now like the, the I would think that, that would be like a solo thing rather than but the idea of like doing things alone is so modern. I feel like that's always just yeah, it is. So I, I remember your hand now still. I'm very sorry about that. So it's really modern, and we can tell that just by Google searching in Korean trends or neighbor searching the use of this word. And before, it, I remember it erupting in South Korea. Just in terms of comparing yourself to other people, when they're given grades in high school, they know their position in the class. So I'm not sure if they, So they know that they're fifth in the class, eighth in the class, ninth in the class. I know according to the average how tall my daughter is and how fat my daughter is and things like this. So it's like she's in the 97th percentile eighth. So you're always getting an idea of where you are in relation to other people. So it's always about comparisons to other people. Um, Stella. I, I agree that they're both adapting to capitalism differently. What I find interesting is that maybe as Eastern societies such as South Korea, they're becoming more individualistic. From what I understand of some Western societies, particularly North America, they might be becoming more collective. So for example, when you use terms sort of like intersectional or intersectionality, where a collective identity based on sort of gender, ethnicity, uh, and such forth, it's becoming less individual and more collective. Whereas these, so they're kind of maybe like ships passing in the night, they should essentially take the best of both worlds, but there's no set course for what's gonna happen. I don't believe that necessarily the United States has the best model. I mean, coming from Europe, when we see what happens in the United States with sort of guns and healthcare, and, and it, it seems really sort of like weird. Um, but the point is, maybe South Korea is succeeding. It's not doing perfect, absolutely. And when you saw those suicide figures, it's tragic, but that's the reality. And how do they manage those situations? And there's entrenched people with power and interest. This is an aging society. This is a really interesting demographic thing. So Korea has the lowest birth rate in the world. It's another fascinating thing to consider. The birth rate is like 0.8. You need 2.1 to maintain the population, just to maintain it. Right? Here it's 0.8, it's lowest in the world. So the population is shrinking and many of those people that are having children are sometimes from multicultural families, like my, my, my own one here. This means that, and South Korea is already an aging society, so there are more old people than young people. So if they all vote democratically on something, just pure numbers, the old people are going to win. And because they're having less children now, lowest in the world, it's going to become a super aging society. Therefore, it's going to remain conservative. If old people tend to vote more conservative than younger people, which even, for example, we might consider ourselves liberal and progressive today, 50 years down the line, our views might be considered old and conservative, right? So it's, it's going to be very hard to change in terms of demographics democratically. It's going to have to be some people that push it forward and make the changes. Let's just do a little bit of Hwarang, if we can. This is really part of the public consciousness, right? So people all know Hwarang. Um, and if you have any other questions, we'll, we'll jump to them. This is a really interesting article by Richard Rutt. And... Um, I've generally tried to give sort of Korean perspectives on it. Richard Rupp is fluent, fluent in Korean and um, various types of Chinese as well. 
really uh, respect his literature in terms of this. Now, the Hwarang, this is what they look like today. They really kind Sorry. of... <laughs> can I see the meme? Yeah. America becoming more collective, Korea becoming more individualistic. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Are you yes, excellent. Um, so, these Hwarang look like this. Beautiful boy, pretty yeah. soldiers, <laughs> right? And military, like this. What did he say? Let's have a look at some of this. Um, we depend almost entirely on the evidence of these, on the Samguk Yusa and Samguk Sagi, these two books. Right? This is where all of these things come from. We have them as warriors. And you'll see if there is a... Uh, an Olympic ceremony, a Korean cultural event, something going on like that, they'll have the presence of these type of people. They'll have people dressed like this and acting like this. But does it have any basis in history? Many Koreans now, middle-aged, and so this was written in the 60s, Many Koreans now middle-aged are scarcely aware of having heard of Hwarang until after liberation in 1945. The tradition of the historians was limited and it is most noticeable that the idea of Hwarang as a military cult does not become prominent until the days when the Japanese are promoting the idea of Bushido. Either from imitation or emulation, it is at the time that the Hwarang are presented as primarily military. How much justification there was for this attitude we shall find, but these ideas of these military soldiers, boys, that we see all around in modern Korea. Richard Rutt says that middle-aged people hadn't heard of them. It's a completely new invention. It's a completely new invention of the past. There are historical records that talk of a Hwarang, but the modern understanding of them is completely different. Fascinating, though, the problem of the Hwarang of Schiller is more scarcely fascinating the problem of how they faded from the scene. So uh, they were there, but then they go away. The factor of the disappearance is interesting because their development was not so much a matter of degeneration as of specialization in some aspects of their original activities in the changed conditions of society. So what happened to them is that the Hwarang might more as be discussed as these type of people, which we're kind of calling, Richard Rutt calls them here, Korean gypsies, Mujari. So imagine, and these are butchers. These are people that work with blood. These are people that kill animals. And they travel around the places and they try to entertain people. So uh, imagine um, circuses, carnivals, people traveling around from place to place. And in that group, they have people working like this. They also have entertainers. They have people to dance and sing. The Hwarang that we know as this, Richard Rutt says, well, they're probably more closely related to these type of people. People that travel the land, people that work with blood, very kind of um, nomads, he calls them here. Nomads, noted in later days, they were noted for producing exorcists as the forebearers of the players, prostitutes, butchers, and other low caste trades. They were from different stock from the Hwarang, but in the end, their descendants inherited the Hwarang name. So the Hwarang become part of this folklore. Now, this is not something that Koreans really want to be showing about, but this is where they come. This is a very interesting film, Wang Enamja. 2005. Wang is king, eh, belongs to the king's man, the man's king. So this is kind of like a, there's the Hwarang, there's the Hwarang, there's an idea of a Hwarang, and there's the king. Interestingly, in English, this is translated as the king and the clown. It's a, it's a very sort of non-sexual, controversial title. In Korea, this was a big kind of idea. It is certain that homosexuality was well known in rural society during the Yi dynasty. Uh, this is conf uh, 
Chosun, Chosun Dynasty is also called the Yi Dynasty. I have heard of it from older men in the villages of South Gyeonggi-do, and Bishop Cooper has spoken of its occurrence in the same area at the beginning of the century. There is a vaguely unsavoury reputation sometimes connected with the, I can't read that from here, Tiban Yangbang, or provincial gentlemen. But I heard in the villages more of the practices of the lower classes among whom, for instance, pedestry seems to have formed a recognised outlet for a young widower and caused very little stigma to be attached to his favourite who on growing older could turn to normal sexuality and marry. I was told that the presence, especially of clothing given to boy, would make his status public knowledge in the village. But the word midong and the reputation for homosexuality were particularly attached to the wandering players and musicians. It was almost normally assumed that all the male teams used the boys as catamites. They were dressed attractively, often in girls' clothes, though not always, and on occasion, it seems, they were also prostituted. Professor Cho sang Su tells me that regular Burdash marriages were sometimes entered into with the bands, and he has met and interviewed such cases. I find it very interesting that these objects of female desire in modern Korea. Right? So again, we see things such as gender and sexuality through the Korean eyes, very different than through a traditional Western eyes. These, these ideas of desire, specifically female desire, arrive through what Richard Rutt suggests might be sort of traveling boys dressed as women, used as prostitutes for the elites. It's not really too different if we consider something like um, Shakespeare's time, boys play women in, in, in theater and something like that. They dress as women. because Women aren't allowed to play the roles. It's a very sort of male society. We see similar things here. Yes. I don't know. Oh. What's a Burdash marriage, anybody? Yeah, you could always search it up. Yeah, let, let's learn something. Yes. Mm-hmm. There we are. So marriages of that type were common in this society. Well, not common, but they were enacted by these people. As with so much else in early Korean history, we know something of the external facts, but we cannot be sure of the heart of the matter. The Hwarang of Schiller remained for us a pageant of beautiful boys dancing in the mist with powdered faces and jeweled shoes, softening an age of barbaric splendor with their adolescent gentleness as much as they ennobled it with their courage. The mist adds its own fascination to the picture. Like the boys themselves, it is as native to Korea as her blue hills. I love this conclusion that Rutt draws here. So he's saying, well, these Hwarang, we don't really know what they were, where they were. But what we do know is that they conjure up real images for people today of beautiful boys, dancing, powdered faces, softening the barbarianism, adolescent. This is kind of what we see a lot in the manifestation of many Korean famous figures today, right? So, beautiful boys. The focus is on beauty. The focus is on attractiveness. It's not a focus, let's say, so masculin masculinity is different here, but the focus is on beauty and attractiveness, okay? So they've got this very big focus on lookism. There's a focus on groups of them together. Dancing, dressed up nicely. Powdered faces, <coughs> softening the age of barbaric splendor. So amidst all the barbarism, amidst all the 
huge social classes, a mix of slavery, and uh, the really difficult lives that people have to live, they bring respite. They bring some calming influence. They bring something that helps people relieve themselves from the existence of the world. But they're also adolescent. They also convey an image of purity. And again, I find this very interesting. So people will consider them uh, akin to K-pop stars of the past. I think it's gone the other way around. I think people have this idea of Hwarang in their consciousness because it appears in dramas, because it appears in public folklore, because rather than talking about the slavery, rather than talking about the barbarism, the, the, the caste differences, the, the, the butchers, they talk about the beautiful people. It's going to be very interesting when South Korea sort of comes to terms with its history. So I think what we see currently in the the West, we see many, many people trying to come to terms with the history of the nation, the history of the country. If you were to consider education in, in, in the United Kingdom, in Europe, in the United States, 40, 50 years ago, it would be all sort of, yay, Christopher Columbus, George Washington, these people, great. Now it's a lot more nuanced. Now it's a lot different. The Korean history, I think, will go that way eventually, but it's not there yet. It still has this romanticized view, and we see that in the Farang. So it provides respite from the barbarism. Is the age... I, I see a hand, I'll come to you in a minute. Is the age important? So there is this idea in Confucianism of, of purity, and I, I've never really been able to understand... I remember growing up, and this might be sort of a very controversial thing, but I, I just want to use it as a comparison. It's quite sort of sexual in nature, so I apologize in advance. Somebody like Paris Hilton could have sort of a sex tape released and make her more famous. People become more famous from that. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but their publicity or, or their popularity wouldn't be so much affected. Or people like Miley Cyrus, Justin Bieber, Leonardo DiCaprio, Taylor Swift, they can have various boyfriends, girlfriends, write about them. They can be agents of their own life, identity, and sexuality. In the South Korean society, any hint or idea that a celebrity has a partner is kind of like the end of their career. So you get Chen from XO, Aww. right? Got married, had a kid. Yet, yeah, no, don't celebrate that. That's terrible. Why? Because it becomes an individual. It's an individual choice, rather than respecting the millions of fans, the paying fans, and such forth. Were any member of BTS to have a girlfriend, that would be like trauma. Oh. <laughs> but, isn't it, but, but it's weird, though, and it, it has to be seen that, that purity is valued, or at least the image of purity. The image of purity versus the reality of general sexual agency. So this is kind of like, you get this with the Hwarang, this image of pure boy, innocence, poets, soldiers. So actually the Hwarang are everything. So they're poets, they're educated scholars, they're military warriors, they're dancers, they're everything that you want them to be. In reality, they might have been sort of traveling boys that engaged in various acts of sort of sexual activity, good or bad. But the, the difference between those two things, it still works in South Korea. There are some things in certain societies that you cannot challenge. So if you think in very religious societies, you can't challenge religion, right? That would be blasphemy. In South Korea, you can't challenge history yet. You can't go onto television and say, yeah, but that's not really real, is it? Can't do that. Can't really do that yet. The one thing that people will always kind of stick to is we have together our understanding of history and that's what we'll keep. Um, I think that's it for today. I want to show you the syllabus. Um, we've kind of jumped through... 
with that. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments at the moment? Oh, yes, Taylor, please, I'm listening. Please. I was going to ask, um, where do you think the people who are, the people who hung would fall in the yin and yang scale? Because it's like the, they're, they're, they don't really fit into the idea of, you know, the, um, the men in that circle, and they more fit in with women, but they're clear that they are men. So where do you think, do you think they're like middle? Or like if it's like, if it's, mm. what is it, is it just, is it just like a Venn diagram? Like are mm. they in the center? Or yeah. Like where do you think they fall? In that? I think the most accurate historical understanding of the Huarang is that they are Boy Scouts. Oh. So that's a really easy comparison to understand. So they're portrayed as these kind of sort of um, military warriors. They're essentially kind of like a group of Boy Scouts. And, and since then they've been... Um, glamorized and romanticized. In terms of a Venn diagram, are they, if we find the picture of the yin and yang, you might consider them, if I can find it, get my head out of the way. Are they not something like this? Are they not the boys existing as girls and the girls existing as boys? Are they not existing in the other one? But that's, if you want them to be like that. The reality is probably they're a group of like Boy Scouts or the reality is they're a group of traveling minstrels. Mm -hmm. However, ask Koreans about Hwarang, look at the dramas, look how they're presented, look how they're portrayed. And it's, it's beauty, it's dancing, it's kind of sexual purity and innocence. So it's a way of painting and, uh, and covering up the history and presenting and projecting something else. So it works, so we get this difference between that and that. So when we see today the popularity of sort of dancing uh, idol groups, how do they connect to the Huarang? I, I, I think it's a very interesting thing to look at. Yeah, Stella. Mm. So I don't really know. It's like, but like young tends to be more masculine in energy, but that doesn't mean that young is masculine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So chi being energy, the terms that Stella was using. So I, I, I don't know if Star Wars is old or new for you, or if you know it, but they have this kind of idea of the force. Mm -hmm. That's chi. That's gi. It's kind of popular here. So when soul was established, the way they use something called geomancy, which is sort of like geographic chi or energy and the way they build it is with the biggest mountain to the north and a river like that so this is good chi if you have a big mountain here two mountains here and the river and this is where Seoul Seoul's original name was Hanyang by the way so the original name of Seoul this what it was called Hanyang during the Joseon dynasty and it was established here why was it established in a place like this so this is the Han River here's Gangnam now it's extended below it was put here because of, as Stella was saying, chi, energy, force, geomancy. In terms of this, just vis-a-vis -vis sort of, um, I, I, I see your hand, um, this one, like the Tao Te Ching, Tao Te Ching written by Lao Tzu in Korean, Noja. Fantastic, interesting book of 88 very short poems. Now you can pick up the Bible, the Quran, the Talmud, and you can go through them and you can find something that goes, well, that's not very true today, is it? Right? You can find, because they're historically based. They have a basis in historicism. If you pick up the Tao Te Ching, which is the book of sort of Taoism, which puts this as its focus, you cannot find anything in there that you'd be able to contradict today. Because the whole beauty of it is based on a paradox. The whole beauty of it is like, um, if you want to do something, don't do anything. You want to achieve that? Well, just give it up. That's the whole basis of it. If you want to go this way, you'll end up going that way, right? So the whole idea of this kind of yin and yang, it doesn't work logically. It works as a paradox. It's all based on koans, like the sound of one hand clapping and things like this. So yeah, I, I think I agree with Stella. It's very hard. As soon as you say something is 
male or female or night or day, it is only half of the truth. The truth is the total.